Hi, and welcome to this presentation on robotics and gaming technology in upper limb rehab. My name is Melissa McConaughey, and I'm a specialist neurological physiotherapist and the director of Advanced Rehab Centre. So to put this talk in context, I wanted to identify what the biggest problem that we currently experience is as therapists and people following uh, a neurological incident such as a stroke, brain injury, perhaps a spinal cord uh, injury, perhaps. Um, we know that upper limb recovery after stroke particularly is unacceptably poor. 66% of patients have paresis following stroke admission um, and about six months following stroke, 50% still remain without function. Um, only about 5 to 20 percent of individuals with um, who have had a stroke actually achieve complete functional recovery, which is pretty low. Um, patients engaged in activity um, in rehab units, um, it, that's typically for only about 13 percent of the day. And that's not just upper limb activity, that's any particular type of activity. Um, upper, upper limb therapy is um, reported to be only five, four to 10 minutes per day of an actual rehab schedule. Um, Constraint-induced movement therapy is accepted um, as clinical practice. And I like to ask the question, you know, how many people typically have heard about CIMT? Um, and then I guess the next question is, how many of you actually implement CIMT? Because in recent um, literature, only about 65, less than 65% of therapists had used it. And of that um, population, very few, if any, had we're actually implementing all of the seven core features of the constraint induced movement therapy program. And we, we try to do as much constraint induced movement therapy here in our clinic and our home based service, but there are quite large uh, challenges, I guess, barriers to using something like that in a community setting. You, you really do need very, very good support networks, a very compliant or not compliant, but somebody that really understands why they need to be you know, put in a situation where it's incredibly frustrating for them most of the day. Um, practice of task-specific functional upper limb movements in only, um, only typically occurs in about 51% of upper limb sessions, which is pretty, pretty staggering as well. And what they've found, what Lang et al found is actually um, in a typical upper limb session, only about 30 repetitions were completed within that session. Um, and therapists overestimate therapy time by anywhere to 28% of, of what the client's actually doing in the day. And I guess the point that I wanted to make is, yes, there's reasons why upper limb rehab and recovery is typically quite poor, and that's at the primary impairment level and the damage to the corticospinal tracts. But I think just looking at this data here and what the literature is telling us, a lot of it's also got to be related to the lack of therapy input given to patients at the acute and subacute stage. And I think that's where we have a really big role to play in terms of changing these outcomes. So prognosis of upper limb post-stroke, and there's lots of um, literature talking about how to how to provide a prognosis to somebody following a stroke, and that can typically be spontaneous recovery at seven days. It can be spontaneous recovery at four month at four weeks rather, um, and that really comes down to how much damage has actually occurred in the corticospinal tracts and in the subcortical areas of the brain. Um, the severity of the stroke at onset typically can be used to determine how much function somebody's likely to recover from. Um, if somebody's got a purely cortical stroke, they typically will recover a lot better than if they have a subcortical stroke. So somewhere in the internal capsule um, or anywhere along those pathways as well. Um, the lesion location can be really important in determining recovery of stroke. But again, um, somebody of the same lesion location and same severity that receives a higher volume of therapy may well do much, much better than somebody of the same lesion location and severity with, with minimal to none, to no rehab at all. Um, they can, the neurologists and specialists can use MRIs and um, TMS to determine how much of the corticospinal tract is actually intact. Um, but again, we don't typically have access to that here in the clinic. So what we are working with with patients is what we can see and, and what further potential that individual would like to explore. Um, there's a large role for spontaneous recovery and I think that's what a lot of patients are actually experiencing because I don't think they're getting a lot of access to full intensive style of rehab in the acute and subacute setting and that's due to no fault of anyone's but rather that we are quite resource restricted in in our public setting settings and and there's just not enough time to look at mobility and getting people independent as well as looking at upper limb recovery as well following a stroke. 
And what happens if people are not um, seeing huge recovery early on is, is you know, we're all inherently wanted to be want to be as efficient as we can or just to achieve an outcome. Um, and so we will typically adopt compensations quite quickly, but also we will also learn that the arm is not use, it's not functional, so we can also um, develop what's called learned on use. Um, and that can be quite profound in patients six months, 12 months, even four years down the track following a stroke, where they're actually capable of do doing a lot more with their arm, um, but they've actually learned to not use it anymore. Um, and of course, we also have to deal with secondary changes further along the track, where there may be soft tissue shortening, there may be contracture, there may be an increase in spasticity and tone changes, um, and all of those just add an extra layer of complexity in terms of how somebody is likely to recover. I think what's most important though is regardless, patients want to explore their full potential. It doesn't matter what the, the MRI or the, the TMS shows, it doesn't matter what the, what the scans show. Ideally, when we see clients in our clinic, they're coming to us because they want to see if there's anything possible, any way that they can, you know, gain any further recovery in their upper limb. And I like to, to use this slide because I think this is where we can offer something that's slightly different. I think, you know, following a stroke or a brain injury, for, for instance, people will have a period of re rehabilitation and they will see quite significant recovery and they will be discharged at this point. And I think what we what we typically experience here in the community is, is patients are coming to us because, yes, they've achieved recovery, but to them, they are still far from where they were before their stroke, far from where they were before their, their brain injury. And that may well be in terms of function or fitness or cognitive capacity or lifestyle and quality of life and it's here where we try and um, work with patients to achieve those those fine-tuning um, goals that can make an enormous amount of difference to people's quality of life and you know upper limb is a prime area where we can really help people who may not have received upper limb therapy in a rehab setting previous to, to, to what we can offer now. Um, so this talk's not about the current literature in, in what you need to apply in um, upper limb rehab, but I thought I would just to I would just go through a few things just to put this talk in context. We know that the goal of rehab is not only to increase the number of repetitions, but also the patient attention and effort. Um, now that's been around for a long time since the constraint and move, induced movement therapy was introduced way back about 15, 20 years ago, since motor relearning was introduced through Karen Shepherd. Um, we know that the, the, the volume of effort required will actually drive error-based learning and motor skill acquisition. So it's not just repetitions alone. Repetitions, will, repetitions in isolation will not drive skill acquisition. They will, however, improve performance at that particular task. So athletes will typically do thousands and thousands of repetitions of one particular activity because they want to get very, very, very good at that one particular activity. Uh, in most cases with our particular population, that's not going to be very helpful to patients if they're very, 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 very good at one particular activity but they can't tie their shoelaces, they can't put on their shirt, um, for instance. So we need to have um, patient attention as well. And I think this can be a really big problem in our patient population for upper limb rehab when we're looking at getting patients doing really high effort, frustrating, challenging tasks to maintain somebody's level of, of interest and attention can be also very challenging in, in upper limb therapy. So as therapists, we need to be incredibly creative and always on our game to provide an environment that is, is incredibly enriching and motivating for, for patients. Um, increasing therapy time typically increases outcome. This is not, <laughs> this is pretty self-explanatory and um, common sense really, but Hannah et al had a study last year where they looked at um, a patient population doing one hour of therapy for six weeks, another patient group doing two hours of therapy, and then another patient group, group doing three hours of therapy. And lo and behold, who did better? Of course, the group that was doing three hours of therapy a day, five days a week for six weeks. So, you know, we have to look at not only the, the effort level, but also the frequency and the dosage of therapy that people are receiving. And once a week in upper limb therapy is not going to be um, successful in achieving the outcomes that most people want to achieve in therapy. Monotonous exercise provides worth, worse retention of skill. Obviously, if there's monotony in the, the exercise, people are not putting in that attention. They're probably not putting in the same level of effort and they're not they're not receiving error-based learning uh, procedures, I guess. So they're not able to retain that skill as well as somebody who was thoroughly engaged, uh, were learning from their own mistakes, were problem solving at the same time. 
physically guiding a movement can get decreased motor learning. Um, now I take this literature from the robotics and gaming technology, but I think it can equally be applied in, in typical rehab where as therapists we like to, to sometimes help patients to show them what the, the right and correct movement might actually look like and feel like. Uh, and that's all well and good as guidance, but if it's, it's manual assistance, then it will typically lead to a decrease in motor skill learning because the, the patient has the opportunity to slack off. Um, they're not actually error, but they're not actually doing making the errors themselves. They're actually being guided along along a path. So um, think about it as you constrain. Um, sorry, your continuous passive movement in in leg orthopedic rehab, for instance, that actually is not achieving any motor relearning. So we want to be really careful if we're helping people in upper limb rehab to not provide too much um, hands-on manual guidance and assistance. And I think if we apply that to the robotic technology, looking at what kind of devices are not providing passive assistance either. Robotic therapy can decrease recovery if slacking is tolerated. And I made that point before, uh, and there's quite a lot of literature there. You need a very complex algorithm in the, the robotic and gaming technology that doesn't allow for slacking. So slacking is where a patient can basically be the, the, the passenger and the robotic, the robotic device or gaming technology is the vehicle to, if somebody's reaching, for instance, take their hand to, to the object, but the patient's not driving the movement, they're following the, the robotic device. Uh, and that will certainly lead to decrease in recovery. And in some results, it will actually be worse off than, um, than regular and conventional therapy. Learning is error based and we know that so therefore faster improvement will be achieved when you can increase the, the amount of errors that a patient needs to take. So you know when you put that in, in a rehab setting you don't want the patient to be perfect at any particular activity because if they're perfect you know they're not learning anymore. So again it's as therapists we need to constantly set up environments or, or ask the, uh, the patient to think about how they could possibly be working harder or how that activity could be more challenging for them. So there's that problem-based learning which means they're learning through trial and error and they're learning skill acquisition and how to refine their, their motor output, their motor planning uh, rather than having nice, clear, perfect movements because that that's actually not achieving very much for the client at all and there's probably little, little retention from that particular activity. And finally, many functional gains are more dependent on wrist and hand movements than on shoulder and elbow. And I guess I put this in here because there's a lot of robotic um, literature that has come from the early 90s uh, right through to the 2000s, which showed that there was very little impact um, to be gained from using robotic technology. But if you look at what they were actually using, a lot of it was based on proximal shoulder movements. Um, and so they weren't actually getting the opportunity to really work on their wrist and hand movements. So you can, you know, again, that's just common sense. If you're not working on your wrist and hand movements, you're not going to get better at that. Uh, and it's a concurrent movement. You need the transportation of the, the shoulder, the elbow and the wrist to a particular target but the, then you need to be able to pre-shape your hand into the right uh, aperture so you can pick up your cup and if you're not practicing that you're not going to get better at it so that's why patients that were using um, previous robotic devices focusing on proximal shoulder strength and range of motion um, they weren't getting better at at activities of daily living and I guess if you think about it like that you can understand why. Having said that now the technology is so much more advanced and there's lots of fantastic devices out there now that are very much looking at fine motor control, they're, they're part of the complete shoulder elbow composition uh, or they're just in isolation and they're just looking purely at wrist and hand movement and we'll talk about some of those a little bit further on. So in setting up our hands up upper limb boot camp, we had a bit of a think about what we really wanted in the in the um, the program and what kind of robotic and gaming technology we would actually like to make use of. And so we wrote down a bit of a shopping list, and these are some of the things that we thought would be really beneficial for our patient population. So we wanted the robotic and gaming technology to drive neuroplastic change. There's absolutely no point in using it if if it's not, because we're not here for wellness. We're here for rehab and recovery. So it has to make some some change for the individual and hopefully it's a functional change. Even if it's at the impairment level, that's that's really helpful for the client if it can reduce spasticity. But ideally we're looking for a, for an outcome um, that, that leads to functional change uh, in their ADLs, etc. 
we wanted the environment to be engaging and motivating and you know once you get somebody using robotic and gaming technology it is completely engrossing we have heaps of brain injury clients in our our rehab environment that you know you'd be hard pressed to keep their attention for for 10 minutes of a particular upper limb activity it's really really challenging to keep them on task you know we get them into the upper limb room and we get them on the gaming technology and that we can't get them off it you know that's 60 minutes of upper limb therapy and they don't want to leave so you know it's it's about setting up an environment that's very very engaging and then purely through that alone you will increase the dosage of therapy because they want to be there it's it's fun it's engaging it's motivating and it's so much different to traditional therapy um, I think one of the values of using the gaming technology is the sensitivity of the assessment tools. So the cameras and sensors are so sensitive now, they're, they're better than what we are as therapists at putting an objective measure on um, grip strength, obviously. That's, that's, that's not a new one, but again, you can put a value in, in um, kilograms on grip strength. You can look at, uh, use accelerometers to look at range of motion of external rotation, of um, shoulder flexion, extension, etc., wrist movements. Um, and then you can set parameters in the equipment um, that will really get the client to to work within the parameters of the movement that they actually have, not the parameters of what the community uh, the computer will set up as an arbitrary setting and I think that's absolutely fantastic for patients that have very low level very uh, limited activity and function in their muscles um, you know we we can't really capitalize on that as therapists it's hard to put objective values on that but this is where I think the gaming technology can really come to the fore because that's where you can put an objective measure on somebody that has very very low function um, and part of the reason why um, we're looking at it being so so effective is the bio and interactive feedback that the computer algorithms have. So because it's gaming technology, it is it's it's looking and responding to what the patient's doing. So it might be a target that the client has to hit. They either hit it or they don't, and then the, the computer will, will set again and they'll get a score for that, um, or they'll get part of a score, they'll get points, or they'll have points deducted. Um, you know, that, that very much is based around that. That error based learning so you can see how quickly somebody can be looking at their problem solving skills to see well I didn't do it that time let's see what I need to do to hit that target this time and they may need to to change that the way they they use their shoulder or their elbow strategy and inherently as I said before people will aim to become as efficient as possible um, to drive effective and and minimal error in their movement um, we needed the robotic and gaming technology to be as um, modifiable to different patient needs as possible. We didn't want to have um, people in the upper limb room that were high level and low level, chronic, acute, um, and not be able to provide options and opportunities to, to every individual in the room. So it needs to be quite flexible in its delivery. Um, the devices need to be quite functional in terms of what they're asking patients to do uh, and specific to daily living and, living and functional recovery. Um, not that we want this to replace one-on-one -on -one therapy at all but to use it as an adjunct and it might as well be as incredibly task specific as we can make it. Um, it needed to be um, simple enough that patients could, you could set it up for independent patient practice and sustainable home programs and there's heaps of gaming technology out there now that that patients can actually use at home and it's priced at a point where it is reasonably affordable for patients to, to purchase this equipment. Um, you can support them in doing that and then they can use this equipment at home. And Finally, making sure that the equipment is as cost effective, practical and easy to set up as possible. Um, I know there's some devices out on the market, the big robotic devices, they can take anywhere from an hour to two hours to change from a left to a right side. And you know, that's not very practical in, in a gym and rehab setting. Um, so let's just have a quick look at a case study. This was a patient that we had um, go through our upper limb boot camp. Now, we've only had two people go through our upper limb boot camp and both have done very, very well. Um, and we use gaming and robotic technology in our upper limb boot camp as one of our three hours. So we run the program three hours a day on site plus an hour of homework a day. We do that five days a week for two weeks. Um, and a large part, as I said, one third of our um, program in the center is actually based around um, gaming and computer technology. Um, so anyway, this lady is 45 years old. She had a right MCA stroke in February last year, uh, of this year, sorry, 2014. She's right hand dominant. 
uh, moderate cognitive impairments, but what that ultimately led to was very, very poor attention span. So it was quite difficult to maintain her attention on task. Uh, impaired sensation and proprioception, upper limb ataxia and decreased dexterity and fine motor control. Uh, looking at her initial outcome measures, her patient specific functional score, so she really wanted to be able to tie her shoelaces and she wasn't able to do that. So she scored a zero, she wasn't able to type and she really wanted to do that. So she scored herself a zero on that as well. We did the fugal Maya, she had 108 out of 126. So reasonably high level in function, um, despite all of her impairments. Box and blocks, she could achieve 34 blocks. Nine hole peg test, she, um, achieved three pegs in six minutes. Um, she was at the ceiling of the MAS six and seven. However, she could only achieve one, two and six on the eight. Her grip strength on the left was 11.1 kilo, kilos and she time to, two, time to tie shoe, shoelaces was zero as she obviously couldn't do that. Uh, and these are on, these are just some of the, I'll just wait for the, these were some of the um, videos that we could see and this is just a quick video of this lady doing the nine hole peg test so you can have a look at her dexterity here. Okay, so we've talked about um, how we wanted to set our robotic training program up and if we use this lady as a particular case study to drive that neuroplastic change we really needed the program to and the robotic device to provide intensity of therapy so not just high repetitions but we needed to have her doing the activities frequently we needed the ro robotics and gaming technology to be available frequently and it needed to require quite a high level of effort to perform the tasks um, and some of the beauty of the different robotic devices that we've got is you can actually set the the gaming level to start with so you could start it as a two out of ten um, and if that person is successful in that round then they will move up a level if they're not successful or they've achieved less than 50 percent for instance they'll stay at the same level and if they've achieved lower than that they'll actually drop back a level so the algorithms in the computer and gaming software is actually sophisticated enough to enable that that level of of complexity for the client um, it will also increase not only the difficulty level but also add in some more challenges into the particular task so not only is it novel it's progressive and it constantly challenges the client to to use their problem solving skills um, a lot of them can be very task specific and goal driven so um, the able m for instance you can use it as a large mouse so for lower level clients who are wanting to get back to using computers it inherently has an upper limb uh, like a, a, a giant mouse type function so they're they're doing that to play the game uh, the Sabo rejoice is fantastic in terms of the number of things that you can get patients to do you can have them opening jars you can have them pulling toggles lifting coins they can be opening doors they can be turning keys um, you know, any number of activities are all part of that one particular gaming device. Uh, we wanted to drive forced use. So if we're, we're looking at constraint-induced therapy, having the patient um, attached to a, con a gaming device on their affected limb inherently is constraint. Um, or it's not constraint, but it's forcing that use. And I think, as I said before, that it's very hard to set constraint-induced therapy up in its purest form in a community setting. Um, but taking them the primary element of that, which is the forced use, I think is quite easy to apply. Um, and then having a buddy coming in to see what's happening to, to reinforce that in the home program as well. Uh, looking at distributed practice, so very frequent but long rests, variable practice by changing the parameters of the task, um, and random ordering of related tasks. So um, not just setting up creative environments of patients sitting there with a whole box of different activities in front of them, but the computer will automatically do that for them depending on the tasks that you're setting up and the games that you're using. And I think, um, you know, just based on the literature, gaming technology is as effective as, as conventional therapy, if not more, depending on the literature that you read. Second thing we wanted to achieve was a uh, sensitive assessment and treatment environment. So we've already spoken about using some of the traditional outcome measures, the box and blocks and the nine hole peg test. Some of the other ones um, would be scoring patients on not only their range of motion, but um, maybe 
use of that range of motion in particular um, activities, for instance. So can they actually get their hand into supination to turn a doorknob or a key? Can they actually lift their hand and do a bimanual turning task into wrist flexion extension and stuff? So looking at the functional activity or application of that, that range of motion. Um, and then for really low level patients where you, you, you know, you can detect maybe a two out of five manual muscle test, you, that's great, you put it down as a two, but you can actually score them on a game on, on gaming technology and they can get a score that will be recorded and as they continue to play the the, um, the game, that you can actually graph that, that progress and see what they are at the end of the program. Um, we wanted the program and the, the gaming technology to be as engaging and motivating. So, you know, just down the bottom of this slide, you can see some of the, the typical exercises that you might give in a physiotherapy session or occupational therapy session for instance there's nothing amazing about these exercises they're pretty stock standard um, and I think I'm going to I'll use these to compare how you might apply some of these same activities in by the use of, of gaming technology um, so thinking about how you might set the environment up um, looking at whether you've got distractions versus camaraderie in a circuit type environment um, how easy is it to set up problem solving for that individual um, and how progressive are the exercises that you're giving and these are all the questions that we were asking as we were looking at the gaming technology and its application. So let's have a look at the first exercise. So this is a really common exercise that's given out in acute, subacute, hospital settings, rehab settings, trying to increase somebody's grip strength. Um, pretty boring, arbitrary exercise, hard to put a value on that. If you use that same construct and look at how you might apply that in something like the Pablo, I'll just show you this now. So what George is doing is setting the parameters. So he's, you can see in orange there, he's just set, that's what his grip strength is. He set the, tar, the difficulty at five and he's using 50% of that grip strength capacity to play the game. And now George has to actually squeeze to make that fire hose move and to put the water on the fire. And he has to sustain the hold until the fire goes out, then he can release the grip. When another fire pops up, it's a slightly different length so he has to sustain lower grip strength until the fire goes out. And meanwhile, the computer is scoring if he's successful or not successful. And it will increase his level of complexity if he is successful in that particular level. It'll keep him at the same or it'll drop him back. So you can see again how that can put objective values on something that squeezing a ball simply just can't. Let's have a look at another one. So again, looking at pronation, supination, and it's great to be able to track this and give somebody key targets, but unless they're just counting repetitions alone, again, it can be quite hard to keep somebody motivated to do more than 30. We're talking about 100, 150 repetitions and then add in comp complexity and problem solving into that as well. So if you look at how the Pablo now used in a ball device can actually be achieved to do the same thing, but I think better. So again, now we're, we're looking at the range of motion. So just down at the bottom of this circle, George is actually setting up the parameters of his movement and range of motion. Setting his complexity level. And then simply by pronating and supinating, he's moving the basket to capture apples. And again, there'll be a score at the end of this game that will take him up a level, keep him at the same or drop him back. And again, we often have patients that don't want to get off devices like the Pablo and so they end up spending 30, 40, 60 minutes in any range of different movement activities um, and then we can then apply that to functional activities in the next session. So. You could just use this in isolation, I think, um, and certainly it's supported by the literature as it being as good as conventional therapy. Um, but as a therapist, I would always want to do the hands-on therapy after a session to really apply and implement that into to functional activities. 
let's look at the next one. So the Sabre Rejoice is another device that we've um, brought into the, the program. And I think, again, this is fantastic. How many of us do these peg exercises, which are brilliant for pincer strength, um, functional exercises, but again, boring as. So getting somebody to do hundreds of repetitions of this can be extremely tedious and, and compliance is typically quite low for this. If we look at the Rejoice and the Stack Attack type exercise, again, you can set the parameters for this. You can have somebody seated or standing. And here we're looking at how you could use fine motor skills to turn keys, lift toggles, lift toggles. That's it, squeeze. And so you've got that, that random practice, that variety of practice for somebody with a hemiplegia, although Lynn doesn't for the examples here, um, that's incredibly challenging to change the direction of movement, the strength, the force that they need to apply. Pull the toggle. Now this is quite a high level um, setting that Lynn's got this on now, but you can see how fantastic this is for fine motor training um, and how motivating and engaging something like this can be and it's easy to see how you get somebody doing 20 30 40 50 minutes on on an activity like this and again it will graph their scores um, and give you a result at the end of that again let's look at able m and these are typically activities that we would like to give patients where they're exploring range of motion they're, they're moving to key targets um, again, can be really boring if you're not working very hard to create a, an engaging environment um, to, to do more than those 30 repetitions at the very least. So this is the ABLE M. And this is the giant mouse I was talking about. And you can just see here, so for somebody that's got very low level, you would be using a table to support their movement and you're getting that, that biofeedback as you splat a mozzie. So if you, need, if you don't have enough movement to do that, you can actually use the active assist section. Yeah. And there he is squatting, splatting mozzies. So then it'll keep moving up levels because he's successful at that level. All right, let's look at another one, Gintronics. Now, I think Gintronics is a really exciting device because this is where we're starting to look at how effective tele-rehab can be in the future. So Gintronics is one of the software companies that has started to use camera and gaming technology like uh, the Kinect, which I believe is an Xbox device, but you can also get this through Microsoft. Um, and this is where you can have patients training remotely and you can be watching what they're doing, you can be looking at the scores they're achieving, how many times they're doing their exercises, how long they're doing it for, how many repetitions they're doing, what level of complexity they're achieving, etc. Um, and I think, again, this is just going to be so fantastic as we move into the future and these, these cameras and sensors become even more sensitive. Um, you can do this for upper limb, you can do this for lower limb, you can have patients in the set, in the um, rehab setting and you can have them at home as well and I think this is just so exciting to watch this particular device um, and another device that we don't have yet but I'd love to get into Australia is called the Gloria and this is absolutely brilliant so here is a task that you might set somebody to do um, in their room in inpatient acute care just for for want of activities if somebody hasn't got a lot of movement in their hand again very arbitrary not providing many targets um, but you could see how quickly using something like a Gloria where it's a glove it's got a very specific biofeedback mechanism you're watching and monitoring and playing games with the available usage of the hand um, and it would again be able to set the parameters and the complexity so you're constantly striving to achieve higher levels in the game and I think again it's just so brilliant to be able to access equipment like this and technology and here finally we have the Armeo Power, uh, which is a massive robotic device um, that is very much active assist using complex algorithms to play computer games. Um, and if it's anything like the Locomat, which is from the same company, Hakoma, the technology is getting extremely sophisticated and advanced now. So it can enable that error-based learning, which in previous models it hasn't been able to do. Um, so again, I wouldn't have considered devices like this in the past, but now that they've got that error-based capacity uh, and it's not just pre-programmed movements, I think it's going to be a much more exciting space to watch.
feedback mechanisms in the gaming technology that you'd be wanting to look for or things that we'd be wanting to look for would be the capacity to provide that biofeedback, how sensitive are the sensors and the cameras, uh, are they better than a therapist? Uh, in most cases, I have to say they are in terms of being able to put objective values on movement. Um, and that's quite an exciting space, I think, to, to see. Um, it, it can provide limited manual guidance if you set the patient up correctly. Um, positions can be enabled to reduce friction and gravity as we do in, in typical and traditional therapy. You can measure performance, it will graph it for you, it can give you pre and post data information and over a number of sessions. Um, and I think you need to be looking at how you can set somebody up for proximal versus distal training. If you've got really high level function, you're probably not going to be wanting to train a lot of proximal shoulder strength. You might be looking more at fine motor control, whereas somebody who's pretty low level has very minimal um, lower limb and hand function, you might start them with proximal shoulder strength, move them down to distal and then get them doing whole practice as well. The tasks of course need to be meaningful. If it's not meaningful, the client won't be intrinsically motivated, they won't be engaged, you won't be able to get the number of repetitions. I think um, being fun can have an element of being meaningful to a client um, and as long as they can see that there's an application to, to improving independent ADL function, I think as well that the use of gaming technology is, is, is far superior to, to traditional therapy if you think that patients are only going to be able to achieve about you know, 20 to 30 repetitions or four to 10 minutes, depending on the literature that you read. Uh, it needs to be specific to independent goals, of course. So if somebody wants to play their slide guitar or somebody wants to tie their shoelaces, um, trying to use the gaming technology that, that best facilitates and improves those type of functions. And you also need the, the gaming technology to drive a level of interest that is superior or if not the same as traditional therapy and I think that in itself is quite easy to do with the gaming technology. You need the multi-user capacity, so high level versus low level individuals, you need to be able to apply or change the, the settings and parameters so that you can use um, the same equipment on, on various different clients. If they're chronic, how far chronic, how long down the track, how many compensatory changes have they started to, to bring into their, their movements? What sort of soft tissue changes, spasticity are they dealing with? How do you change the, the settings to accommodate for that? Are they really acute? Again, what kind of conditions do you need to set up for that individual client? Do they want need to be standing? Are they going to be sitting for the activity? Can you get them doing part of the exercise in standing and then sitting? How quick or how, how long does it take to set up the device and how quickly can the therapists and the clients become familiar? If you want to enable independent practice, it needs to be quite self-explanatory and intuitive so that the client can set themselves up or have a buddy there to help them um, crack on with their exercise as well. Looking at uh, an analysis of of the equipment and the costs of this. And this is what we looked at quite carefully in our rehab unit as well. So looking at a level three physio, once, once you take into account, you know, out of pocket costs to pay the therapist, what their superannuation is, mat leave loading, uh, annual leave loading, work cover insurances, etc. We're looking at about 105,000 a year in New South Wales on the health, New South Wales Health Award. Um, imagine they can do 30 patient hours a week just for arbitrary sake, by the time you take out case meetings, notes, anything else that the, the, the patient, the therapist needs to do. Looking at 46 weeks a year, once you account for um, holidays, annual leave and public holidays. So let's just say, put an arbitrary figure there, they can do 13, um, 1380 sessions a year. So if we divide 105,000 by 1380 sessions a year, that gives us a dollar value of 76. Then if we go down the, um, the, uh, the table there, you can start to see how each item costs out as well. So the Sabo Rejoice, you're looking at $12 per session versus the Able M at less than a dollar a session, Gintronics at $7 a session, right up to the Glorias and the Armeo Power at 156 and 33 respective, respectively. So it kind of gives you an idea of how we can start to apply some cost utility to these. And this is a really basic cost utility analysis. But if we had four patients in a circuit using this equipment, it would cost us $122, um, $122 per hour to use four pieces of equipment. But what that gives us is four patient hours an hour five hours a day, so that's 20 patient hours a day, that's 100 patient hours a week. So that's giving us 46,000 
patient hours per week just to use the equipment alone versus 1,380. Now, that's a bit of a ra random figure because it's very unlikely that you'd have four patients in that room five hours a day who didn't need any help or support in setting up. So I think you'd have to then add in a therapist to do that. But you're still looking at a basic 11% increase in capacity, even in that alone, in the first year. And you could then look at depreciation values for three to five years. And I think you could quickly see that this will very quickly pay for itself, not only in terms of cost utility, and but more so in outcomes for the patients. And I go back to the original patient, yeah, to the original point I made that, Yes, we can't see how much of that corticospinal tract is actually intact, but I think part of the problem that we're also experiencing with patients getting really poor results in upper limb is that we're not training them hard enough either. And I think it's looking at innovative, novel ways and using the techno technology that we have available to increase patient therapy hours. And if it, if it comes down to gaming technology, then this is how you can quickly see that you can increase therapy hours significantly um, with, with minimal financial input. Uh, the latest Cochrane review in 2012 stated that arm training with electromechanical and robotic assistance seems to be more effective than other interventions for people with stroke. Now that's a pretty bold statement and that's coming from the Cochrane review. Um, their results were based on 13 studies which included 552 patients showing an increase in acti activities of daily living, especially in the acute and subacute phase. They weren't able to show an improvement in chronic patients. Um, however, they also showed that arm strength did not improve and this was in contradiction to their previous Cochrane review produced in 2008 which did show an improvement in activities of daily living and arm strength. Um, so I think again we've got to look at the robotic devices that are actually being used and whether they're passive assist, um, how intensive therapy is and also what's happening in this chronic population and can we do something more to help the chronic population. Um, surprisingly dropouts did not increase and in fact I think they increased um, and you can see how if you're creating that enriched in motivating environment patients are much more likely to stick around and do their therapy. So just to follow up on the case study that we showed originally this is the same lady doing her nine hole peg test at the end of the two week boot camp. And over here, she's tying her shoelaces. And if we look at her outcome measures at the end of the two weeks, so at the beginning, she wasn't able to tie her shoelaces. At the end, she was able to do that. And she was able to do that in 45 seconds. So I guess what we've done now is set her up with the opportunity to practice that at home and get better and better. Um, now, because she's eight months post-stroke, we've got some pretty good control data on this lady on when we first assessed her to when we started the boot camp, and there was no change. So we know that she wasn't achieving any significant functional recovery in the period before she started with us in the one month period prior to when she started with us. But in that two week boot camp, which incorporated some of the gaming technology we've been talking about, she's now able to tie her shoelaces and she's started being able to type. So she's scored that on her patient specific functional scale as a four out of 10, but she can go away with the skills to, to keep adding to that in future. Uh, and every other outcome measure has improved quite considerably. Um, so her grip strength even has gone from 11.1 .1 to 17.9 kilograms. So I think what we can see from, from the data here, and this is of course a single case study, but even in high level patients that aren't achieving independence in their functional and daily, daily activities, we can increase the dosage of therapy that somebody like this person who has significant um, distractibility, she's very hard to keep on task. It's that use of gaming technology which kept her engaged and motivated enough to, to, to pump out three hours of therapy every day. So we've implemented the gaming technology in our upper limb boot camp. We do an hour of um, gaming technology every day as part of our three hour program. Uh, and then patients, once they've completed the boot camp, which we like to think of as a kickstart, they can then come back and use the robotic technology in group sessions. So we've got two groups running at the moment. We've got one that's part of the boot camp and then one that's for patients that want to come and use the, the gaming technology after they've finished the kickstart boot camp program. Um, 
the other client that we actually had in the program who came along, he was very, very different to the first lady you've seen. He was quite low level. Uh, he wasn't able to use the Sabo Flex when he started with us. Uh, he wasn't able to open a door. He wasn't holding his medication um, bottles to, to open them, for instance. Um, and at the end of the two week boot camp, he's now able to go ahead and purchase a Sabo. He's Sabo ready essentially. Uh, and he wants to, to use that for sustainable practice at home, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Uh, he is now opening doors regularly during the day. So he scored himself an eight out of 10 on the patient specific functional scale. He's using his slide guitar, which was a rec recreational activity and a goal that he'd set himself as part of the boot camp. He'd scored himself a uh, one at the beginning of the program and now he scored himself an eight. So he's using that. It's recreational, it's enjoyable, and it's also part of his ongoing sustainable rehab program. So I'm really excited about our upper limb boot camp. I'm really excited about the use of gaming technology in our boot camp as well. Uh, I'm really excited about what our other devices are out there and, and how we can be part of the, the latest technology. Technology, um, and ultimately how we can be part of, of helping people with, with impairments and activity limitations following stroke, brain injury, spinal cord injury and MS for instance. So thanks very much for listening. If you've got any questions, don't hesitate to give me a buzz. Uh, I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you.